given this much stuff and you got to figure out how to do it with this much money and, and bring that all transparently and give it to the warfighter so when his hand comes back, it's there for him in the right size, the right quantity, in the right amount, at the right location, and it's able to accomplish the mission. That's what I need. So it could, it's okay if it looks white. We found that out. Green isn't necessarily the right answer. And so I don't have to put this thing through a very deliberate, there are those systems that must go through the rigor of a very complex, deliberate process. But there are those things that I can just reach on off the shelf commercially and put it on the battlefield quickly so that it meets the needs of the warfighter. So just learning to operate within these uh, constrained resources at times, but providing that warfighter the right capability. Let, let me just add one final point. As I sat here thinking about how inadequate my first answer was, um, <laughs> I should mention one other very critical thing that's, that's happened to Army Logistics, and that is the work of the gentleman sitting right down here in the, in the front row at Forrest Burke, who, when he was on active duty, helped us to realize and to put into place something we call VSAT, the Very mm -hmm. Small Aperture Terminal Absolutely. Satellites, commercial satellites that we now have in every logistics organization in the Army. You know, I could show you a chart from 2003 where we literally went into a black hole in transmissions. As we crossed the berm, we were not sending requisitions anywhere because we couldn't. We had no means. The communications infrastructure that we relied upon was moving, and we couldn't talk. 30 days of that, it created an enormous uh, bubble that uh, we had to deal with for the next year. Today, as a result of some forward thinking on, on several, uh, a predecessor of mine several times ago, and, and for us hard work, we now have communi satellite communications for every logistics activity, in fact, sustainment activity uh, in the Army at every echelon. It's pretty powerful stuff, and it's changed, it's been a game changer. Okay, I'm sorry, I've talked enough. Next, there was another question in the back. Please. Good morning. First and foremost, I want to thank each of you and your soldiers for securing our freedoms. Uh, my question is related to in theater supply chain management and our weapon system readiness. Um, relative to supply chain management, <coughs> are we migrating away from the transaction based way we used to do business into the performance based, and are we seeing any efficiency gain there? And as well as are in our new acquisitions with weapon systems, are we able to get any performance based agreements? that will kind of enhance our readiness. I know it's a new initiative and we're, we're trying to move forward with it. Sure. Yeah, I'm gonna take an initial shot at that and then I'm gonna ask Bill to, to speak up from the standpoint of Army contracting and performance-based logistics contracts. Uh, we still are transaction-based uh, at the tactical level and um, I don't see that changing. Um, we, we gotta keep remembering that this war that we have been involved in since 2001 is a special kind of war. And all, all the, except for a brief period in 2003 when we attacked the Baghdad, it was a, it's a special, it's a coin operation. It's relatively, relatively secure, which <coughs> makes it us able to do a lot of things different. We can bring contractors in to support us. We didn't in that brief period when we crossed the berm. Um, we got to keep reminding ourselves of that so we don't design an army and an army logistics system that's reliant on a benign environment where you, you operate with relative impunity. Um, because if we get into a full up heavy fight with somebody else, and I don't know who that will be, and I'm not gonna speculate, but if we do, we're not gonna have the luxury of secure supply lines and contractors who can go where and when they please. And we'll have to deal with the kinds of problems we dealt with in 2004, when there was a deliberate effort on the part of the enemy to shut us down, and they did shut us down, and we had contractors who were refusing to leave Kuwait because they said, I didn't sign up for this shit. I'm not doing it. Um, and that, and that's, that's not to be, that's not unexpected. We should expect that sort of thing. So we ought to be careful about what we do at the tactical end of things. And, and uh, so we're not, we're not designing ourselves something that relies on, on an OEM or a contractor being right there present with us. Having said that, there's still a lot we can do uh, as an example, the, the Javelin that we're buying today, the, the Command Launch Unit, we call it the CLU. Command Launch Unit is the acronym. Um, it essentially re is so reliable, which is a good thing. That's something very important to us as we procure new weapon systems. The more reliable it is, less maintenance it requires, 
all sorts of good things happen. But it's, it's so reliable that we no longer attempt to repair the javelin clue forward. When it breaks, and that's infrequent, we just mail it back to the OEM for repair. Uh, and we've given the, f the guys forward some floats, some repair cycle floats, so that they have an immediate uh, return of the thing to serviceability, not the same one, the broken one goes back, they get a replacement. Uh, and that's worked out pretty well for us. And, and because it's an infrequently, uh, uh, the repairs are infrequent, that's cost effective for us. So that, there are things we can do, but, but we're being very careful, Bill, on PBL. Just a quick comment, and uh, Jim, if you want any comments on this as well. Uh, the one system that I'm aware of that I've worked as a deputy PEO before that we've used that very successfully has been the shadow system in performance-based logistics where you contract with someone for a certain level of support, parts availability, and that equates directly in a readiness for systems. Uh, we could probably use that a lot more, actually, in some of our other uh, major weapon systems, and that's probably one of those lessons learned that that we're gathering out of theater as well. By the way, the UAVs are performing remarkably uh, over there. Other questions? Do you have a question? Oh, okay. no, no. <laughs> Frank, Frank uh, first of all, you're not as old as I thought you were because prior to DRMO, it was PDO. Oh, okay. Property right, disposal. All right, good. Uh, sir, my question is, um, obviously, in the last 10 years, depots have changed dramatically. Uh, people think that we overhaul things and store things. And today, it's, such, it's uh, so much more than that, um, that the term, I believe, depots and arsenals are antiquated. Uh, we're really logistics support centers, logistics spaces, and we're really the only service left that has depots. And has anybody given any consideration to how we can evolve and advance? You're talking about in the naming convention? The naming yeah. convention that, uh, that... That's a great comment. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing I would, and I'll take that on, uh, and I will, um, with Mitch's help. But one of the things that our Army is really good at is, is maintaining its historical um, roots. So uh, we'll, that, something that we'll have to discuss, though, Frank. I Thank you. It, yeah, there's no question. The depots today are not your grandfather's depot. I mean, they, we, I don't know how many hundred depot workers that we have downrange today and have had downrange for the last five, six, seven years. Uh, and, and I see them continuing to serve. And that, that is the new normal for us, that depots are going to be operating <coughs> forward. They're not, things aren't all going to come back to Anniston or to Letterkenny or to Kobe Hanna to be repaired. Depots are going to go forward uh, to do repairs. And so maybe we, you know, maybe that it's time to, to name them something differently. H having said that, the Air Force does have something that looks and smells a lot like a depot. Uh, and so does the uh, Marine Corps and so does the Navy. <laughs> um, but I realize they don't call them that anymore, and that's, that's probably a uh, smart move. I, so I would commend, sir, that the term depot maintenance, that's all about things from retail logistics space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a logistics center. Sure, right, Frank. And, sir, before the next question, uh, I'm going to have to break contact uh, to head to another session with uh, my boss. Dismissed. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, all right. My name is Mike here. <laughs> I'm sorry that General Pillsbury is leaving. I know this is near dear to his heart. Uh, we're trying to mitigate a lot of... Uh, a lot of multiple RFIs coming from theater to building and uh, all over the map. Um, I'm from PEO, CS, CSS. Um, and we have a diverse portfolio with trucks, as you know. Uh, is there any way we can get ahead of this? Uh, we're just getting an abundance of uh, RFIs in relation to uh, the, the drawdown and personal equipment and contractors on the battlefield, you name it. But this is, the redundancy is just ridiculous right now. I'm just trying to see if, if the leadership can take a look at that. Oh, um, I need to make sure I understand the acronym you're using. Is it is the RFI you're talking about a request for information? Roger, yes, sir. You're getting asked questions, and you'd like to uh, make me make the questions stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, you can keep the questions flowing. Just through one um, oh, entry point would be great. We get it from NMCI, we get it from the building, from ASAW. 
Well, that's the, it's that's, all over the world. That's the power it's of the email. same information, too. That's same the power request. of email. Anybody's got an email address, and anybody can send a message. So any, the way to, to deal with that is just, uh, you know, stop answering them. <laughs> <laughs> Refer them to their chain of command, if that's a, a concern to you, I'm, honestly. I mean, I, I get a fair share of those, uh, those RFIs myself. And, and, you know, sometimes I answer them, and sometimes I, I pass them to who ought to be answering them in the first place. But, but I understand the concern. Anybody else? Sir, no hard questions. Uh, <laughs> no hard questions? Good morning. Hey, Larry. Thank you all for the, the great presentations. Uh, I, I think through all of this, from the tenure path question that uh, Jim Hall asked, where we are today, the question right now is, is what are we doing with the new MOSs? What are we doing with the new skill sets? We've got ERPs, GCSS Army stood up out at the NTC. We've got LMP D3 that's just completed. We've heard from Jack, reverse logistics and the things that are going on, and Bill yesterday and today on, on log cap. Uh, who's managing that? How is that being managed? Who interfaces with them? We've got SCOE set up, a great show down at uh, Fort Lee and in other schools. W what are we doing to relook at both the civilian and military uh, applications or, or requirements for skill sets so that industry can better interface to help in line with uh, those new needs? Well, that's a good question. I should defer it to the commander of the Sustainment Center of Excellence who's sitting here in the front row, but I won't do that to him. Um, I, I would, having been a commandant in TRADOC and having been the CASCOM commander, I'd, I'd tell you that that you may not see it, but there's this constant cycle of review of what soldiers, what we should be teaching them. And, and uh, I know, for example, in the Ordnance Center today, they are looking at a fairly radical change in how you, we train mechanics from where we used to not be comfortable that the soldier was trained until the soldier actually performed the task, a task-based approach. You know, you, you don't know how to change an engine in a Humvee until you change a engine in a Humvee. Uh, and so, and because there are multiple tactical wheel vehicles, we made them change an engine in a Humvee, and an MTV, and an HTV, and a Hemet, and a PLS, and so on. And the courses got longer and longer the more equipment we added. What the Ordnance Center is looking at now is something called skill-based training, where I teach them the concept, maybe give them an example to train on, but what's important is they understand the concept, and then the rest of it will flow just by reading the tactical manual and the diagnostics that we give them. So that sort of thing is going on in all of the schools, in all of the log schools. I know in the quartermaster school, they're obviously uh, going to have to adapt to how they train and have adapted to how they train STAMUSes, the, you know, whether it be SAMs or SARS or now GCSS Army. We've got an entire group in the PM that's focused on deliverables, training products for GCSS Army because it is way different than what the soldiers are used to. And what's more important is understanding the power of the tool. Th this SAP product, this commercial ERP that we have bought, has got like this much capability, and, and the challenge is going to be unleashing the power of that capability. We've got the same problem on LMP, the LMP side, where, you know, even today, I think Frank, I don't know if he's still here, would tell you that, that the guys at Toby Hanna still don't understand how powerful a tool they have at their fingerprints or fingertips there. So I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's not any one thing. It's not a um, big bang kind of a thing. It's something that you've got to evolve with as the technology and the tools change uh, that you work with. And, and I don't know if any of you guys want to. Yeah, you were on that that NCO? That's one thing I did think of, but I, uh, I could mention is 51 Charlies is NCOs. Uh, and we continue to assess them at about 90 per year. Uh, that we want to bring into the Army to do contracting work. And they will be reclassified and recoded into contracting. And actually, many of them are working across the world today in support of contracting operations. Air Force does this extremely well. They're probably world class at it. Uh, Mitch mentioned Haiti in his opening remarks, had that chart on the, the screen. Uh, not well known, but a contingency contracting team went in as one of the first sorties into Haiti to help set up host nation support and to execute, co execute contracting operations. I think the smartest person you could take if you go into theater right now would be the smartest Air Force non-commissioned officer and contractor because they are brilliant at it. 
and what we simply want to do is try to mirror much of what the Air Force has done in building our NCO structure inside Army contracting. And we're on our way to doing just that. But it begins with assessing the right kind of talent and experience into our NCO core for contracting to make sure we get it right. Have Sir, thanks. So we have talked about warrant officers uh, with Army Material Command and others. And I know that was part of the recommendations that went forward. Uh, continues to be a point of discussion, but uh, as of, it becomes almost a force structure discussion inside the building when you look at what you can resource and what you can afford, uh, whether warrant officers or NCOs. So right now we're uh, remaining to stick with NCOs. More to come though, probably. Okay, I think we, sir, at, at, at the end of, we're about two minutes from 10, but I don't see anybody jumping up and down with their hand in the air, so I think we've, uh, we've covered the, the majority of the questions that are out there.